All right, so I'm working on a little project here. Um, what I'm doing is I'm drilling the holes for the power feeders for the Kato Unitrack. So I've got the speed, uh, max speed drill. Um, I feel horrible because I don't remember exactly what size it is. Um, but it is a speed bore drill bit. Um, it's just big enough to fit everything I need through there. Um, this one's actually uh, the exact size of us um, PVC that'll fit in there. Of course, I don't remember. I am terribly sorry. Um, but all I'm going to do here is a quick shot of me drilling a few holes, making sure that I've got power feeders everywhere that's necessary. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with Kato Unitrack too much, um, especially at the crossings, uh, crossovers, and switches, um, there is a lack of power going through them. So every side of each switch is going to have power feeders. So if I've got two switches back to back, this portion here, sorry, if I've got two switches back to back, then these portions will be uh, connected here. So I'm going to have tons of power feeders in here. I'm not going to have any issues with electricity getting to my locomotives or my freight cars. And with Unitrack, I generally have a rule of thumb, blue wire in. So this side of the track, everything towards the center. Um, there will be no reversing um, track on the layout or anything that I might have um, connectivity issues with. So it's going to help keep things really simple. And then I'll have a six prong setup um, for power to signals, power to the track, um, and a DC power pack for accessory lighting. Uh, I'll go between each module. So, and then eventually I'll have holes drilled for these guys. Once I have a better idea of where everything's going to be planted for sure, this track here, I'm sure of, isn't moving. And if it does, I'll just fill the hole. Um, looks like I've got a little grab iron here from, uh, maybe from my, um, I'll go with Central Cars from Rapido. I have had a couple issues with the grab irons falling out of those. Um, that's something I still have to address with Rapido. But I'm very happy with them overall. So I'm going to pause it here quick, go into the super fast mode, and I'm going to drill a couple holes here in some key places. And as I get to a place I want to make note of or make sure that you guys are aware of something different, um, I'll let you know. But one thing I've gone through is taking a colored pencil and lined out exactly where all the track is, going, uh, is. So that way when I put the track back, it's exactly where it should be. Um, that's for two reasons. One, so you make sure you know exactly where you're going to drill your holes. So I marked a little hash mark here on the side. Um, just going in a little bit right here. So you can see, maybe you can see my lines. Um, and then I put a little hash mark. So that way later on when I'm doing stuff on the layout, I already know where my utility utilities are at. So without any further ado, those butterfingers today, without any further ado, here we go. All right, so now I'm going to show you how to install the Kato Unitrack power feeder. Come in this little packet, part number 24-818. It's a quantity of one. At my hobby shop, um, with their discount is $3.50. List price is about $5. So I'm just going to open it up here, like so. I'm going to feed... The connector, the mail connector through, like so. Drop that down in there. Before it gets too far, I'm going to pull off the connectors on here. And here. I'll see if I can do this right. No, I guess my S Pen isn't working the way I thought. Um, anywho. Oh, I can't change it while it's live. Alright, so hopefully you can see what I'm doing here a little bit. Um, so what I'm going to do is, again, make sure that blue is to the inside. And then what I always do is I make sure that the wire that I'm putting on is going underneath the track. Like so. So when this one gets pulled out, this will come off this way. So you see the wires coming out, 
Uh -huh. Now we'll pull that down into place, snap it back in, and just like that, it's done. So I'll go ahead, I'll do a few more, and then I'll take a short break. All right, so we're under the layout now. I'm gonna show you a couple little things. Um, if you'll notice, I've got three wire drops here, okay? What I'm gonna use is this little splitter from Kato. Now I'm just gonna plug all these in. If you have all the wires facing the same way, you're fine, because these only get plugged in one way, so you don't have to worry about cross wires. And now I only have one that I have to plug into my bus. So what's nice about this is everything's organized. So I can write on here that I have a specific block. Um, and it's even got arrows on here, not that you need them, but you could label this, say, hey, this is track one, section A, track two, section B, track three, section C, if you like. Um, not that you have to get into it that much, but I'll probably take this one as the Pepsi plant. So if I need to start troubleshooting, I just unplug it. And I can do that. This will also be great later if I decide to go to block detection. I can isolate everything and have everything labeled under here so I know exactly what wire is what. Um, that's one of the really handy features with Kato Unitrack. I know you can cheat, use your own wiring if you like, but I prefer to go this way. It's part of the convenience of Kato Unitrack for me. And if you notice, I've got a little box down here that's catching all my trash and everything that I drill so there's a little less mess to clean up. All right, now that we're back on top of the layout here, I'm just going to take a short time lapse of uh, me going through and highlighting all the places on the layout where I'm going to have um, power feeders. I'm going to take my pen here, I'm going to trace out where all the track is over here, move all the rolling stock around so that I can have everything exactly where I want it, outline, and then mark. And I know exactly how many I need to order. Um, unfortunately, all the pieces I have are extensions. Um, splitters and uh, I only have one more feeder so I need to order some more feeders and I know exactly what part number I need to order. Um, for the three piece divider that's 24-827 and that's a three way extension cord um, 90 centimeters and you'll get one per pack. List price is $650. Um, sale, uh, sale price I can get it down to $455 um, at one of my local hobby shops. Um, so check in your local hobby shops. The more you buy, the more likely they are to kind of help work with you a little bit. Um, firstly, I recommend Southside Trains and Hiawatha Hobbies. Um, they always give you a fair deal. Um, I, don't, I don't know how often that they have stuff actually at list price. Um, so they're excellent hobby shops to visit. Um, so without further ado, I'll get moving. Alright, so here we're going to go over a couple little things um, to tune this car. I've already gone through, put some of these couplers on here, and I've gone ahead and painted the trip pins to look a little bit more usable, so it looks like an air hose. I just sewed in the tips and then painted the trip pins black. Um, not a whole lot of underbody detail in here other than the basic stuff that you'd see from the side of the car, um, but we're going to go through and set the height on these because you can see they're a little little floppy here. So first we're going to see if the coupler height is correct and if the coupler height is correct then we just have to adjust the trip pin. Um, so I'm doing this with the NMRA gauge so you can see that the height is a little down but if we lift the coupler up it's actually just about the correct height. So we know we don't need to do a whole lot to get there um, there were shims in here with the um, scale KD couplers that came with it, but because they didn't quite fit with these, um, I took them out. So now I see that I do need them, and I might have to shave them down or modify them a little bit. And of course I saved them. I've got this box here of um, stuff that I always save for my cars and equipment, so I'm going to pull these shims out real quick with my pliers here. 
if I can. Or not. I'll have to do this the old fashioned way. There's one shim. There's two shims. And so we have both box curves here. I'm going to pull out all four, assuming that they're going to have the same issues, which may not always be the case. Um, here's number four. So to take one of these apart, it's actually really simple. I wish that these had individual coupler pockets, but they don't. Um, so what you have to do is actually remove the trucks. And then the frame will actually lift off on its own. The frame just comes right up with a little bit of work there, just like that. Um, which if you ask me is one of the problems with these, um, because it's not screwed on, um, it doesn't work the best that I feel personally. So what we're gonna do is since we want the couplers to stop from drooping, we're gonna put these shims back in here, like so. Clear off the some of the debris from the bottom of the car. Just lightly place the couplers. Flip it back over. And I use the couplers to kind of hold everything in place. Now this one worked out, unfortunately, this one over here didn't work out so well. You can see the shims come loose over here. So I'll grab my pliers again. Pull this off. Let's place it over the coupler like so. So that the holes line up a little bit. Lift the frame. Slide it under. And just kind of wiggle it around until it fits. So now that the coupler is in, it's still moving freely with the shim in there, um, which is something you want to make sure. Otherwise, you might have to shave it down a little bit or play with it. Um, I've never had to lubricate a coupler. Maybe a little bit of um, graphite from a pencil or something to slide around. But I never want to put anything liquid in there because then it can seep into other places and whatnot. And that just seems like a dangerous thing or potentially harmful to the car. So I'll carefully put these screws back in. I found that these are, on a couple of these Atherin cars, are actually stripped. Now, when you're putting the trucks back on, you want to kind of tune the trucks a little bit. And what I mean by that is um, adjust the truck's ability to move around and its freeness, you know, rotating and turning and whatnot, for your layout. If you have a bulletproof layout and everything's perfect, the track work is perfect, the switches are perfect, you don't need a lot of flexibility in here and it'll help the car run better. If you've got them really loose, um, the car will bounce around and could have a tendency to derail more. Now, in an old Model Railroad article, um, Model Railroad article, they said one of these should only have two dimensions of play and swivel, the other one should have three and you adjust it as the layout requires. So in a club layout that might have a little bit more realistic track work, you could say, um, you might need to tune them a bit more. Now that was the case when I belonged to a couple different model railroad clubs and I was frequently using all of my equipment there. I would take hours upon hours to tune a single freight car if I needed to and it would run flawlessly after that. I've got a video of a 200 car train on there um, and for the most part it ran very well, um, I think. Um, if you watch it you might find that to be a different case for yourself but hey. Um, so. Just make sure when you're putting the trucks back on that you're tuning them a little bit for your layout. So being that I have Unitrack, um, everything's going to be level, everything's going to be quote unquote perfect. I don't feel that I need a whole lot of flexibility in these. Um, I want to make sure that it tracks well accordingly. So I'm going to put this aside. Move that out of there. That is not a prop. Alright, so now we're going to check this again. Coupler height looks good. Trip pin height is good. We are set on this side. Uh, actually, the trip pin might have to come up, or the coupler height might have to come up just a wee bit. 
Actually, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring up the coupler height a little bit with a couple little red washers here. So I've got these. Oh, that's not them. <clears throat> here they are. I believe I've red and gray. Okay. So I've got these two different sizes of washers here. Um, uh, the red fiber washers and the gray insulating fiber washers. Um, actually, they're both insulating. But they're truck spacers. Um, that's how I use them. So 209 and I think 208 or maybe 210. Um, I'm not sure. But, um, oh yeah, this is 208. Last three digits here, last three digits here. So these are 208 and 209. Awesome. Always keep some of these on hand. They're great just for this. Um, so what I'm going to do is just dump out a couple here. I'm dumping out four, assuming that if this one needs it, that one will probably need it. Um, so what I'm going to do here is take the truck off again. Put on one of these washers. Sometimes you'll have to file it out to fit over there, fit it over properly. Um, and then it also adds, because it is a fiber washer, it adds a tiny, tiny amount of suspension. Not anything you, you may notice, um, but it, it does add a little bit of flexibility to it above and beyond what there already was. So I'm just going to go ahead and do both of them right away. If you notice when I do this, um, I, tighten the, I tighten it down until the truck doesn't move at all. And then I loosen it up. That's to help set the washer all the way down against the bolster here. You can see there's a little bit of space there. And uh, you use the truck as kind of a press. To press fit that washer on. And for me this has always worked very well. Um, so I just tighten it down until the truck is not free anymore. Okay, It's not hardly moving. So I know that that washer is pressed all the way down. And I'll loosen it up until I have the trucks exactly where I want them. Just like that. Maybe a hair more. Um, like an eighth of a turn. You'd be amazed. Yep, just like that. There's so much more play. You really need to fine tune this. Okay. Somewhere in there. Just a bit of a turn. There we go. That's what I want. All right. So we're going to take this guy out, put him back on here. Wow, that's much better. I'm going to get this up here so you can see it a little bit better. If I can do it without knocking everything over. So you can see the coupler height. Boom, right there, dead nuts on. So we're going to turn the car around, put it back on the track. Same, oh, nope, that's high. So I could probably take that red washer out of this side um, and check it again. So we're just going to go ahead and do that. Chill. All right, and just like that, We've got our cupper height set perfectly. Boy, I really suck at this. So we've got our cupper height set perfectly here. Let's see if we can look at that. Oh, that's not quite. There we go. No, oh, there we are. All right. So you can see the coupler and the trip pin height is set perfectly per the NMRI gauge. Um, these aren't expensive. Um, I forgot what these go for at the local hobby shop, but I want to say this was like seven or eight bucks when I bought it. Um, with the new tariffs, it might have gone up a few cents or a dollar or something. But I'm just going to go through and do this other car real quick, and it should only take a moment for you. All right, so both cars have been gone through. Uh, they've got the semi-scale couplers. They've got the painted trip pins. They've been set to NMRA height. Everything should be good to go. Um, trucks tuned and everything. So let's go try them out on the track and the crossings now and see how it works. All right, 
So before, this wouldn't go over the crossing because the trip ones are too low, so I knew that they had to be set. So now you can see they work just fine. They roll effortlessly. Everything works as it should. So the next thing I'm going to tackle now is this guy. You can see the coupler height's a little bit off on here. Um, the tank car is a little bit high. Um, I do have the proper uh, shelf knuckle couplers on here from KD. Um, they're not the semi-scale like I prefer, um, but I still think they look better than the plastic ones. I just don't like the plastic ones at all. Um, well, the coupler height is not horribly off, if we take a look at, um, I'm sure that it's uh, a bit off from the NMRA gauge. Since that we know that these are set and that that is a bit high. It also doesn't help that the coupler is significantly larger. Um, but eventually, um, when, it's, when it's time to start operating, I'll use magnets to uncouple these um, rather than a pin from overhead or something. So as you can see, there's a little bit of difference here. It's not too dramatic. It's actually maybe not even worth worrying about. Um, but I do like to see the majority of my rolling stock all pretty similar, even though the prototype isn't that way. But if I go to a friend's layout with this stuff, it's nice to have it exactly how it should be. So I'm going to put these in the order that they should be in, because the Sargento car here is going to get dropped off at the Michaels um, facility uh, for Pepsi. Why is this thing sticking? Got a coupler that's sticking here, and I'm not sure why it's sticking closed. I'll just playing with it a little bit seems to get it working a little bit better. I have had this happen a few times with these uh, bulk packs of um, couplers. Uh, I called up at Katie and they were able to send some replacements. But um, sometimes just working a little bit, playing with it back and forth, tends to do the trick. And it seems to be the case, um, not for this one. But the other one works just fine, so we'll just put that one over here for now. So what would happen is my engine here would come through, drop this off, drop the box car here, drop the tanker on the curve here. I'll have piping running from out here to go towards the building for corn syrup or whatever chemicals um, um, or things for the drinks. And then I'll, this box car will get dropped off over at the Sprecher building and that's how that would be. And they'll be um, serviced by the Milwaukee Road, Wisconsin Southern, and Milwaukee Racine and Troy. So, on to the next thing. Here's the DPU light. I think he's just making sure the crossing is safe. 